slides as well as sort of symposia like this. And in a lot of ways, um, people appreciate the breadth of topics it offers. Um, but I think in a lot of ways as scholars, this is a, a place on campus that we know feeds our souls as scholars. And it also offers models of critical thinking to our students. Um, in addition, of course, many of us here uh, have received seed funding for both our own projects and the ability, which support, come on in, which supports our ability to uh, support graduate students and student employees too. So I guess I'm asking you, in the name of love, perhaps, <laughs> or in the name of, I don't know if you feel this way, but I never feel better on campus than when Walter introduces me at the Humanity Center brown bag, you know, the whole like, the whole long bio you get. Um, so I just wanted to just ask you to join me today. If not today, because it's a Friday, because you have other things you're doing, then when we mail you things in the mail, if you would consider a, a donation to the Humanities Center to keep this work going forward, to support students, to support um, emerging scholars, we would appreciate it. Thank you. All right, now I switch to my moderator role. Um, and this is Dr. Michelle Ronick. And she's in, um, sorry, CMLLC, which is the College of Classical. Classical. Okay, I'll just let her say. Languages, literatures, and cultures. I'm unfamiliar with the CMLLC. But I will say, she's going to give us a fantastic talk on the Michelin Vivendum. So she's going to take us through how it developed and became this icon, how it was also on a, one of the first sort of notable things in the advertising industry, as well as how it now, because of the automobile, Michelin now has the Michelin star, and restaurants get this Michelin star. So she's going to take us through this trajectory. Um, she got her PhD from Boston University, and she's been uh, at Wayne State since 1996. Her research includes classical philology, textual criticism, classical tradition in English and American letters, as well as a special study of classics and people of African descent. So, I give you Dr. Ronick. While I get this mic on, the um, slides are critical, so if you would get close to the screen or move forward, there are various elements I want to point out, and you can see them much better if you're close to a screen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Edwards, where are you? And your faculty <laughs> staff. I've been twice on the board and um, have benefited from the kindnesses of the center for many years. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, classical culture has long been appropriated by businesses to market their products. My own essay, Versace's Medusa, capitalizing upon classical antiquity, published in Helios, illustrated how Johnny Versace used the face of Medusa to market his products. By decorating his designs with the famous face from antiquity, he made Medusa's ancient face modern, while his contemporary fashions became timeless. Here in Detroit, the Illich family has for many years used Caesar, that is, little Caesar, Caesarion, who was the son of Julius Caesar and Cleopatra, to sell pizza. <laughs> in Lansing, the mascot of Michigan State University, a Lacedaemonian named Sparty the Spartan, a uh, well-known figure to us, uh, Senator Justin Morrill, the author of the Morrill uh, Land Grant Act of 1862, declared in a speech in 1857, excuse me, 1858, to the U.S. House of Representatives that if this bill shall pass, institutions would spring to life and prove, quote, like the schools of ancient Sparta to be the perennial nurseries of patriotism, thrift, and liberal education, and like those of Sparta, would turn out men for solid use and not drones, end of quote. <laughs> It should be noted that MSU closed down its classics department a number of years ago, and now Sparty has no one with whom he can converse. That is to say, <laughs> MSU has kept him as his mascot, as their mascot, but has obliterated both his language and his classical heritage. Aww. The name of the sports footwear company, ASEX, 
is an acronym of the, these Latin words, anima, or there they go, it's up here, anima sano and corpora sano, based upon a line from the Roman poet Juvenal, who lived around 90 AD, mens sana in corpora sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. Another sports company, Nike, took its name from the Greek goddess of victory, Nike, and the graphic artist Carolyn Davidson patterned the swoosh upon the sweep of her wings. And this is the Nike from Samothrace of Samothrace in uh, Paris. Two well-known automobile companies have done the same sort of thing. Both the Volvo and the Audi car companies derive their names from Latin verbs. The former comes from the verb lowera, meaning to roll, and the latter comes from the verb audio audire, meaning to hear. And this was a verbal pun based on the German verb horschen, to hear, and the name of one of the company's founders, August Horsch. My study will demonstrate that Vichelens Bibetum is another and earlier example of this very dynamic. The classical origin and evolution of Bibendum vis-a-vis, -vis, a revolutionary turn in tire design, is the theme of my paper. There he is. <laughs> First, some background. In October 1887, John Boyd Dunlap, <coughs> the Scottish inventor and surgeon, invented the pneumonic tire by gluing tubes of rubber to the uh, wheels of his son's tricycle. A few years later, in France, in 1889, André and Edouard Michelin tried to help a st stranded bicyclist figure out what he had done with a Dunlop tire that had gone flat <coughs> to his bicycle. And in so doing, so serendipitously came to invent the removable pneumatic tire. Now, patenting the design in 1891, they used their rubber manufacturing plant in Clermont-Ferrand to produce their new invention, the replaceable, inflatable tire. Their discovery would revolutionize the wheels of human transportation from the tires used by bicycles and motorcycles to those used later on by automobiles and airplanes. Their international success was achieved in part by their ingenious use of the nascent industry of advertising, and their new product was marketed through the creation of Bibendum, who has been the mascot of the Michelin Tire Company since 1898. Here's what happened. The Michelin brothers saw a stack of thin white rubber bicycle tires, their own, and white because rubber is white on display uh, that seemed to look to them rather human. So they hired graphic artist and Michelin advertising designer Marius Rousselon, also known as O'Gallop, to pull the image together. And he drew a commanding and rotund figure at a banqueting table who stood with a wide mouth French champagne glass filled with road rubble. This is all broken stuff. We know this. It's all over our street. <laughs> and he adorned it with a caption, Nunc es vivendum, here, uh, taken from the poetry of Horace, who rose to prominence during the age of Augustus. Now, this is the first line of the last ode in book one, and it is poem 30 to be exact if you'd like to read it. The opening words are, Nunc es begin mendum, now it is the time for drinking. And this uses the Latin gerundive construction, uh, known as the future passive participle of the verb bibo, bibera, to drink, to form a construction formally called the passive periphrastic. And this shows the necessity for an action to be taken. We know this word from agenda, agenda, things that must be done. I think you know that. Uh, this ode concerned the Romans' happy reaction to the suicide of Cleopatra VII in 30 BC, and also served to mark the one-year anniversary of her paramour, Mark Antony's defeat at the Battle of Actium the year before 
by Augustus. Now, in this way, the poem heralded a successful Roman revolution in power as the Republic, which had been operating since 510 BC, gave way to a new system of government, the imperial one-man rule begun by Augustus. The advertisement itself heralded another new age, the advent of an inflatable, removable tire that was so resilient it could swallow up rugged red way uh, rubble, just like the nails and the broken uh, fragments in the champagne glass that the uh, roly-poly <laughs> man of tires was about to gulp uh, down. And it would vanquish all opposition. As we can see, tire X here and tire Y, uh, tire X, is actually continental, and tire Y is Dunlap, and you can see them that they are entirely unable to compete and um, are almost entirely uh, uh, deflated, while momentum grows strong and vigorous in vibing these roadway hazards. It did not take long for this gerundive bibendum to become a proper noun and take on a life of its own. And this happened in July of 1898 when the very successful race car driver, that's for you, Cynthia, uh, Léon Serri, uh, was heard to exclaim to the Michelin brothers after seeing Rousselon's poster at the Paris to, to Amsterdam road rally, voila, bibendum, vive bibendum, capital. The French people themselves were perfectly acculturated to understand and even relish this design, which was both new and old, nouveau et classique. The educated people of the middle and upper classes of 19th century France were steeped in classical culture, and those who were not so fortunate to go to school were not left out. They had their own understanding of, as the images Emblems and designs from classical culture were everywhere apparent in French art, architecture, and design. A good example of this is the Roman Peleus, this red cap, the Roman cap of liberty. She's wearing it as well. Uh, this is Louis XVI, Louis XVI, and this is Delacroix's uh, uh, painting, Liberty Guiding the People. Uh, and this cap became the symbol of the French uh, Revolution. Uh, this cap, in fact, little known fact, was uh, um, going to adorn the Liberty Statue on the top of our Capitol building um, if the uh, Secretary of War at the time, Jefferson Davis, had not vetoed this design in 1848. Now, indeed, elements from the classical world could be seen everywhere by everyone in this French landscape, which was and still is dotted with Roman ruins. For those who attended school, Greek and Latin were required courses in the schools throughout France. And the works of Horace were a curricular favorite. Marius Rousselon and his brother Ulysses studied such. And in fact, you'll note, both bear names from classical antiquity. Marius, the consul seven times in the first century BC, and of course Ulysses, the Latin equivalent of the Greek hero Odysseus. And in 1882, Marius himself won first prize in English and Latin while attending his high school, the Lycée La Lande de Gourde in Bresse, which is not too far from Lyon. From that point on, the Wait a minute, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> he's, he's here with us now, making his presence. <laughs> <laughs> From that point on, uh, Vivendum was inseparable from the tires which formed his actual body and from the tires that his parents, the Michelin Company, sold. He became the physical manifestation not only of an innovative technology, but also of a most successful product of the new industry of commercial advertising. And to do this, Michelin employed a great number of graphic artists over time who made their own special contributions to his image. In 1901, an artist only known by the initials W-I-L, which are down here, put Bibendum into the costume of a Roman gladiator after Michelin expanded its line of merchandise 
to include an exercise system of rubberized pulleys and cables. You can see Vivendo has grown quite slender using this exercise <laughs> machine. His belt reads in Latin, win case, you will conquer. And the crowd is shouting out, poli que verso, thumbs down, kill this opponent, death to the opponent. And there's another one that's been vanquished. Um, and uh, as we can see in the middle here, uh, the Venus of Milos, in fact, under this regime, grew back her arms <laughs> with this powerful equipment. <laughs> On the right, which I guess you cannot see, it's cut off here. I'm sorry, I tried to squeeze as much onto one slide as possible. This is uh, Henri Genevieve's uh, design from 1925. And what it is, see these little wings? Uh, Bibendum is now dressed as Hermes, uh, also known as the god Mercury in Roman mythology. Bibendum caught the eye of the early 20th century furniture designer Eileen Gray, who made the Bibendum chair in 1917 for the wealthy Parisian hat maker and stylist Madame Lavie. And in 2009, the French designer Tony Grillo came up with his own interpretation in stainless steel for the Heyman firm, which is headquartered in Paris. But the most important cultural intersection was made between the food and drink that were brought together by the wheels of automobile travel. Here, in another drawing by Roussillon, this is 1905, uh, he signed his name O'Gallop. We see Vivendum over here exulting, right, with his champagne over the victory of Léon Serri in the second annual Gordon Bennett race, which was won on Michelin tires on July 5, 1905. As before, Tire X, Continental, and Tire Y, Dunlop, languished, deflated, and suffering on the ground, beaten. In 1907, the Parisian paper Le Journal began running a column called Les, Ludi, Les Lundis de Michelin that was penned by Maurice Edmond Salion. Salion is better known today under his pen name, Per Nonski, which he coined from the Latin phrase, Per Known, Why Not, in 1895. And he actually described himself at one point as wearing a tunic of Nessus, a phrase from the myth of Hercules, known today to us from Shakespeare's Anthony and Cleopatra, uttered by Anthony after losing the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. The phrase itself, Cournot, actually occurs a couple of times in Horace's own writings, and it is, in fact, the motto of the Marquis de Lafayette, our Revolutionary War hero. Cournot is today considered to be the inventor and the promulgator of gastronomic motor tourism, which Michelin guidebooks facilitated, and the Michelin star rating system stimulated. The Michelin brothers published their first handbook in August of 1900 for the World's Fair in Paris, calling it, quote, a small guide to improve mobility. 35,000 copies with advice on repair shops, hotels, and restaurants, and fuel stops were given away without cost. And the popular project quickly expanded to include foreign countries. For example, Belgium in 1904, and uh, Britain, this is the 1911 uh, guide to Britain. Detailed ratings of restaurants and hotels were made and they were widely studied by motorists. Today's gastronomads, whom we see searching out Michelin-starred restaurants on their Michelin tires with their Michelin guides, developed from the confluence of these socio-historical and economic forces, with Michelin products as Roadmasters par excellence and Bibendum as the company's toastmaster, the culinary history of France was thus radically changed, and in fact, its culture democratized. No longer were the French aristocrats the only persons in France who could experience 
experience called cuisine. Here began today's cult of a local war and what we call, quote, the farm to table movement espoused by mm, Alice Waters or Jeremiah Tower at Chez Panisse in Berkeley decades before we had a name for it. Michelin, a company whose global reach includes 68 plants in 17 countries and over 112,000 employees, celebrates Bibendum's 120th birthday this year. Roussillon's design brought together French interest in haute école, haute cuisine, and technological advancement together on a national level. And this was all very Horatian. For those of us who have read Horace, we know that he often extolled the joys of artisanal farm-grown Roman food and handmade vintages of wine. In 2003, the Financial Times report on business declared the Bendum the best advertising logo of the 20th century. It is hard to predict which logo may dominate the 21st century, but Vivendo has clearly rolled along into the 21st century. Here is some evidence from more popular culture. This is a cartoon comic book strip, uh, Asterix the Gaul. Uh, this is the English version, but you see the chariot has broken down, and the wheel is being repaired by none other than a tiny little bibendum. The next frame of the cartoon actually has a line about, um, call me fat, have you seen his spare tire, or the spare tire <laughs> on him? <laughs> Here's another one, a Kathy Simpson's interpretation. Not to be Michelin, I'm a pub grub of the year. Here's John Adams. Uh, I don't care if you're a food critic, you're not coming back in my restaurant wearing only a sash. And there he is in his rotundity. And then this touching uh, cartoon. <laughs> the Joe Boy meets his papa, and the magazine, tired, tells us all. <laughs> You can find Bibendum today, immortalized in stained glass, at the Bibendum House in London, a building now owned by the legendary designer and bon vivant Sir Terence Conrad. This Art Nouveau Art Deco hybrid building was built by the Michelin Company in 1911 and now boasts the Bibendum Restaurant, which hopes to win its own Michelin stars one day. <laughs> Here we can find our Horatian gerundive, happy to serve us butter, <laughs> and sorbet. He's right here, like Atlas holding up the dessert, right? Um, so long live our classical heritage, vive la France, and the most famous future passage participle in the world, Michelin's <laughs> Bibendo. <laughs> was Latin for having something to do with drinking. Of course, now Bibendum, you probably think it just means he's bendable or something, which is completely <laughs> false. <laughs> they only talked about him as Michelin man then. I think it's interesting now I know why um, chefs are called Michelin star chefs, because it's from Bibendum. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there is, there's still, there's a Bib something. It's a it's a new kind of guide to restaurants that aren't so uh, expensive but have really good food too. Mm -hmm. And we have our own new uh, Michelin star chef in downtown Detroit. He's protected from the Trump Corporation or something in New York. So I read. Mean, uh, you know all that false news we have out there. <laughs> Other questions. 
how did you come up with the idea to trace the history of this particular figure in advertising? A great deal of my work concerns classical tradition, which is the impact of ancient Greek and Roman culture upon later times. So mm -hmm. I did my Versace thing to great success uh, a number of oh, years ago. Precursor. Well, yes, but I also hunt this out in Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams. Mm -hmm. I found this in Tom Stoppard. Mm -hmm. I've worked on Sarah Rule, the playwright. I've also found uh, all kinds of classical uh, traditional studies among African Americans of which we were fully unaware. Greek textbooks by people of African descent. Latin textbooks by people of African descent. And this is all known, sometimes they call it now reception studies, but it's classical tradition. And I, my dissertation advisor was one of the pioneers of this years ago, Meyer Reinhold. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect. I mean, I do the straight philology. You're welcome to read my study of juvenile satire 12, or I can <laughs> send you, uh, you know, my emendation to a line in Petronius if you'd like. But this is a, another direction. Nobody? Anybody? Uh, I guess my thing is that um, most of these languages, you know, like Latin, you, they're like dead languages. So who, whose bright idea was it that we should go all the way back? Like the Nike sign, like I didn't know that was from history. Well, because they're actually not dead. 60% well, uh, of the English is Latin, another 10% is Greek. Now, all the Romance languages, my Spanish colleagues, Italian, French colleagues, you'll all attest to this. It is living through us. And the very fact that these advertisers are clever enough to put, pick this, and I just gave you a handful of yeah. uh, trying to fit in with sports and movement, because this is mobility, revolution, rolling. Um, it, it's everywhere. If you don't know it, however, it is, as Schopenhauer once said in an essay on the Latin language, as if you are in a beautiful land in a fog. And I'll mention one thing. Downtown there used to be the Medusa Cement Company. Anyone? And I went there to find out if they really knew Medusa was Medusa. And yes, she was on their cement base. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, students think that means the middle of the USA. Med USA. <laughs> or something. You know, they go, you know, I mean, the level of not knowing yeah. is deep. Common sense isn't common, I believe it. Well, do you know the campus marshes? We have the second one. I don't even know what that means. What is a campus marsh? The field of Mars. Yeah. And it was the traditional place in Rome where mil military people assembled. It's also the burial place for Augustus. And the only other campus marshes in our country is in uh, Marietta, Ohio. It was oh. 1796, and it was really a military installation. Our Augustus Woodward came up that way as he came to the city, finding it a rubble, you know, burned. He had to lay out the new city, and he put the campus marshes there. Of course, you don't likely know that he named himself Augustus, <laughs> and he studied classics at what is now Columbia University. So Augustus was a city founder, a lawgiver, all these things, and I am certain our Augustus Woodward knew this when he picked this for that site. But we ourselves don't even know what he looks like. Do you know we have no pictures, no images? There's no notice of this campus marshes stuff down town, and he went on to be appointed, he came here under appointment under Thomas Jefferson, and then he was a judge, you know, for the Northwest Territory. He was sent to Tallahassee, and there he was also a judge, and he died. He knew it. He wasn't pover impoverished, and he knew all the good people. He died in Tallahassee. We don't even know where he's buried. Um. This, our highway out to Pontiac, <laughs> the Woodward Avenue, the land <coughs> of ultimate mystery, but yet, this is clearly classics. And when he put in those great long roads, he's thinking of L'Enfance, Washington. He also predicted that this city would be a great metropolis like Rome. He says it. Yeah. He says this. He predicted our location. And we're on a snaky kind of river, which Rome is on. Rome has an island, the Tiber Island. We have yeah, Belle Isle. Yeah. If you know the ancient geography, it's all very clear. If you don't, yeah. you're in the dark, like Schopenhauer says. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. It was a great presentation. Um, I was just thinking about some of the ironies of the Michelin star coming from the Michelin man. Um, I hadn't, um, I mean, I was aware of the connection with the Michelin guides, but I hadn't thought about the connection with the revolutions of wheels and the petroleum culture that makes 
the kind of Michelin stars possible. And I've, I've heard recently there's chefs who are giving up Michelin stars because of the pressures and stresses of, of the sort of progress that's nurtured along by the sort of competitive nature of the, the Michelin restaurants and, and the sort of fame that comes with them. I'm just wondering, I was thinking classical tales no doubt have lots of cautionary tales in them, and there are probably ironies inherent in Bubendium as well. I was wondering if you see any of the ways that the, um, the icon might point out some of that or might caution people into embracing um, the sort of culture of mobility. Um, Why don't off, yeah, I know what you're saying about the Michelin restaurant competition because they're also saying there's insider, you know, a little double dealing and all that. I'm not well familiar with that at all. But the irony is, I don't know, I'm just a, bo a bibendum proponent. Okay. And I see that there's a manifestation of, of so much. You know, the bon vivant who can drink and he serves utilitarian purposes. But there is a racial aspect, you know, he's white. Mm -hmm. And I've read, read some essays that say, oh, this is racism. No, it's not, this isn't when he's looking like this. Rubber was white back then, <coughs> white wall tires. I mean, we've heard of those things. He does hit Africa. And there are some strange advertisements with Bibendum, not classical, so I left that alone. <laughs> um, when he's in Africa, there's, you know, he's a worldwide figure, and these artists shift him as necessary to try to appeal to the market for better or worse. So there may be some deep ironies there. I likely will not pursue them. Okay. I mean, do you think of any? Do, do you yourself think of some? I mean, I'm just thinking of the ironies of um, the sort of the culture of the road, um, encountering these intensely local cultures of food, the ones that you're pointing out, um, and the fact that something sort of ultimately, now it's a petrochemical product like the Michelin tires are now, right. that would be aligned with something that's sort of as far from... Well, it's, it's deeply aligned with colonialism and rubber plantations, mm -hmm. and that was Dunlop and Continental. They're all doing that exploitative um, like, um, use of resources. So, well, I, I think it's too much time. No, it's not.